Hello, this is Angela with Parker's Permaculture. It's a rainy day here in Portland, Oregon. We are in zone 9A. Used to be 8B, but times are changing. So it's rainy, I'm in my car, and you may say like, well, why are you wearing sunglasses? Uh, I have an autoimmune disease that is flaring really badly right now and it attacks my eyes. So sunglasses it is for the video today and maybe for the next couple of videos. Uh, despite being on steroids and three different kinds of antibiotics, it's struggling. So today I want to talk about dandelions. And if you live here in the Pacific Northwest, dandelions have been blooming for a number of weeks. And by dandelions, I mean a number of species in the genus Taraxacum. Easily identifiable. They're one of the first flowers up in spring and they love to proliferate on lawns and roadsides and are known for being pioneer species and also for being really tenacious and able to thrive in locations like sidewalk cracks where other things can't, right? I think a lot of us have a fondness for dandelions. Um, all those little games like mama had a baby and his head popped off that you play with dandelions or I remember when I was a kid my big sister would um, pick a dandelion and say she was gonna give you some butter and then rub it on your nose and you get all the pollen all over you. The high pollen content in dandelions is actually one of the benefits of them and something that I'm going to get into in a minute. But why do people love dandelions besides the nostalgia and besides the fact that they're an early spring bloomer? You know, in the past few years, maybe the past 10 years, there's been a lot of pushback against the perception that dandelions are like obnoxious weeds, right? They, they pollute the visual appeal of your monoculture lawn by adding kind of a broad leaf plant with a, a rosette and a flower that messes up that aesthetic of a lawn. And so dandelions have been seen as notoriously frustrating to folks who want that perfect manicured lawn look. And because they are so hardy and resilient, because they spread so easily, they just gained a really bad reputation, right? I think that for folks of previous generations, you know, dandelions are kind of seen as a scourge in a lot of ways, despite the fact that all parts of the dandelion are edible and the young spring greens are often used in salads. The flowers make an excellent, very light floral wine. I don't know if you've ever had dandelion wine. Someone in my permaculture group used to, used to make it and it was amazing. So Taraxacum, um, you know, this movement, the last decade or so has pushed back against the idea that dandelions are a pain in the behind. And so let's preserve them. They're a really early flowering plant and they are great forage for bees. When bees are really hungry early in the year and there may not be other things blooming yet. So let's leave all the dandelions and we'll save the bees by doing that. And that's a really good positive message, right? I think that being focused on what kind of food pollinators need throughout the year and being aware of the interplay between pollinators and the flowers that they are pollinating super important to observe and respect and try and create forage and habitat for our pollinators. Now, I personally have a soft spot for dandelions. I let them go all over my yard because my ducks and chickens really like them for early snacks. And I find that they do get quite a lot of visitation by bees. But depending on where you live, there may be better early forage for dandelions. And so in the last few years, especially this year on social media, I've seen a number of people saying like, actually, you know what, dandelions aren't that great. You should rip them out. And I know that things tend to be cyclical on social media. The like, save the bees. Oh, actually, honeybees are really bad. Grow, grow food, not lawns. And then actually, like, oh, no, growing food. No, no, no. You should grow all natives, not lawns. Right? This kind of like hyperbolic pendulum swinging sort of behavior. So of course, after a few years of, yay, dandelions, they're the best, save the bees, let's do the, do the dandelion thing, protect the dandelions, don't weed them, don't remove them. It's kind of swung the other way to dandelions suck. They're really inferior and go ahead and rip them out. Now, depending on where you live, they may be native or they may be introduced or they may be invasive. But dandelions as a type of bee forage, let's talk about that for a second. Are we really saving the bees by making sure that we keep all our dandelions? There are some studies, and as always, I will link to those studies below. Some of them are really old. The one that I see cited quite a bit as proof of why we should not have dandelions 
uh, as kind of like the focus of our forage conservation efforts is from 1968. So it's like a little bit, a little dated, but some of the research is as, as late as the late 20 teens. So I'll link to all of that below. But basically there's, there's some evidence that when you have early blooming flowers early in the spring, and depending where you are, you may have not that much else blooming besides dandelions, but where I live, about the time dandelions bloom, especially the latter two thirds of their blooming cycle, of their initial wave of blooming, there are a bajillion fruit tree crops in bloom and also a bunch of native plants in native trees in bloom as well. And also a number of shrub crops, be they native or be they fruit crops like honeyberries also in bloom. And so, you know, this, this, uh, you know, perception that dandelions are the only early food for bees. When there are tons of other things, there are snowdrops, there are crocus. If you're looking at low lying things coming up out of the lawn, tons of early bulbing plants that bees love, bees love crocus, come up even before dandelions. And if you live where I live, things like rosemary are blooming in February. And so there is quite a lot of forage. But also, again, there's cherries, there's plums, there's pears in bloom about the same time that our dandelions are in bloom. And this study from 1968 talks about how when there's a variety of forage and there's lots of dandelions about, that bees may choose dandelions over fruit crops, which we want our fruit crops pollinated. But even more than that, fruit crops supply a rich source of nectar and pollen, including pollen with a larger diversity of amino acids than dandelions have. Dandelions really don't provide nectar to our bees, be it honeybees or native bees. They are a pollen source, which is important. They need it to feed their brood, to make bee bread. You know, pollen is the protein um, source for our pollinators. So they don't really get nectar, but they get pollen. That pollen is deficient in some key amino acids that other kinds of crops that are blooming at the same time or native plants have in abundance. So you're sort of looking at this comparison of trees that are blooming at the same time. And the bees are choosing the dandelions, even though they are nutritionally inferior to these other crops that orchardists and gardeners would prefer to have pollinated and that provide a better range of nutrition for bees at the same time. So there was a study from, I think it was 2017, again, I'll link to it below, that talked about how honeybees in particular have a really poor ability to differentiate between the quality of the food they're consuming. So if you provide them with a slice of like white bread, wonder bread, and you provide them with some kind of really dense, nutritionally enriched multi-grain bread, they can't really differentiate between those two foods, right? And so, they'll go for whatever is more easy to access and whatever is closer and more readily available. Honeybees prefer to kind of forage from the same type of plant for a given period of time, right? So even, you know, I know when I harvest my um, honey out of my colonies, you can pull out a frame and it will have pollen in it and you can see how they will fill in the pollen all from this one kind of plant that's blooming at the same time because the pollen will be different colors, right? So kind of like a grayish, lavenderish pollen, right? That will be when all the blackberries are blooming. There are other things blooming at the same time, but the bees from the colony will all dance and communicate like, hey, here's a cluster of blackberries. Let's all go get nectar and pollen from this area and then come back and fill in our um, cells in the colony. And so you end up with them kind of like mob grazing almost the same kind of plant and then moving on to something else. And so when there's a lot of dandelions, they'll just keep feeding on dandelions, even though they are nutritionally inferior. And they can't really tell that the food that they're feeding on doesn't contain all the proper nutrition. It's just filling their stores, basically. And so, you know, dandelions start to look not that great. Now, the same... Now, there is research showing that bumblebees can kind of differentiate better. There might be some ability in a number of bumblebee species to tell which foods are nutritionally less, um, which foods provide less nutrition for them. And then let's not even get into the complicated issue of how much do we want to be supporting honeybees. Now, as a beekeeper, I have a lot of videos about my feelings about the rabid anti-honeybee crowd. And again, it went from save the bees to honeybees are evil. Of course, if you live in Europe where they're not an introduced species, you're gonna be like, what are you talking about Americans? 
but honeybees are an introduced species here. They are a naturalized introduced species. And so, you know, because people tend to see this dichotomy of like, it's honeybees or native bees, instead of I can be a beekeeper and I can also, through my love of honeybees, learn about native bees, become an active, rabid conservationist of native bees, and want to learn everything about the 6,000 species of native bees in North America and work to conserve them. Most of those species we know very, very little about. Um, we can support all of those guys, right? And we can we can recognize that honeybees are here, they're naturalized. I only catch swarms in the wild, I don't buy bees. And so I'm catching bees that are already out in the environment and I'm giving them a home. And they're here. And so I do actually wanna supp supply their nutritional needs and I wanna care for my colonies and get honey from them, which is more environmentally sustainable than you know GMO sugar beets. But we wanna make sure that we are providing good forage for our native bees as well. And we know that dandelions, especially if they're introduced, like they're not ideal. So is it worth all of this intense pushback of like dandelions kind of suck, like don't, don't have them, don't grow them, pull them out, don't worry about them. I think it's a much more nuanced conversation than that. And as with anything on social media, that tends to be how it goes, right? This very strong polarity, these very strong opinions, because that, because that's what gets clicks, right? Having this, like, don't do that, actually do the complete opposite. What we know about dandelions is that if all you have is a monoculture lawn that is essentially a food desert for pollinators, and there's not a lot else around, dandelions are not a bad option. The downside of that is that dandelions growing in a lawn are much more likely to be exposed to pesticides and herbicides because people tend to treat their lawns. And so you're looking at a forage that is nutritionally inferior and also maybe sprayed. If people use best agricultural practices, there is a much lower risk to tree crop flowers being contaminated with pesticides and herbicides. I don't spray anything on my trees, so they're completely free of anything that's going to be a problem for pollinators. But if there is nothing else, dandelions will suffice, right? Dandelions are kind of like the gruel of bee forage. They're not great. They're not providing the full cohort of nutritional needs for bees, but it's better than grass, which is not providing anything. So you don't have to be like anti-dandelion, but you can also focus on the fact that we should be supporting our bees with better food choices and recognizing that if we have the ability to grow something that is providing food for pollinators that is better suited to their needs and might be native bonus than dandelions we should do that nobody is planting except i think there's a pink dandelion nobody is intentionally planting dandelions but much like honeybees they are naturalized and released into the environment or maybe where you live native if you don't live in um so they're here, not terrible for bees to visit, not that great. There are better foods. We don't have to freak out and say dandelions are horrible, let's get rid of them. But we also don't want to present dandelions as like this amazing, perfect food for bees earlier in the, in the year, right? And instead let's learn about like, what actually are the nutritional needs of our pollinators? What actually does provide the best forage? And let's give them that. So for me, I wanna follow the science and the science here is pretty fascinating. And I think if we, if we are looking at the literature, if we are, instead of operating based on garden myths and garden folklore, we're observing what is happening in nature. Permaculture principle, observe and interact. I always say permaculture is really rooted in good scientific method um, enactment, right? We wanna actually use a scientific method if we wanna do good permaculture. We're observing if we are really tracking what's happening and we have good data to guide us, we can see that actually, you know, maybe the folklore is not as accurate as we thought, and maybe this is an opportunity to expand what we're doing to be more effective for pollinators and, and to like expand our own understanding of the natural world and how species are interacting with each other in the spring. I think for me, this is not some tale of like, oh, we were sold a bill of goods about dandelions or oh, the hype about dandelions is overblown. Yeah, it's overblown. But here's this great opportunity to actually learn about what pollinators need, to actually learn about the kinds of nectar and pollen sources that are better suited for them, how we can promote those in our permaculture gardens, in our 
um, you know, city parks, in wild spaces in general, and how we can better meet the needs of all our pollinators. And then secondarily, we can go down a rabbit hole of who are those pollinators besides just honeybees? What are the native pollinators in my area? Be they hoverflies, be they birds, be they um, native bees, be they beetles, etc., etc., etc. And so I think there's an opportunity here whenever we have one of these memes on social media to say, hmm, you know, what's really happening? Can I is there like, can I, can I go on JSTOR? Can I go on Google Scholar and just like look up what's happening and, and see what the data is around this, you must do this, or this is the best practice. Is that really true? And what is the opportunity here to expand my understanding and do better? So thanks for watching with me today. I'll be back from my garden next time here in Portland, Oregon. Please don't forget to click like and subscribe. And I hope that you check out the articles down below as well and think about what makes good forage for pollinators in your garden and what you can provide them that is blooming early in the year so that they have a whole banquet of nutritionally dense food for them besides just the dandelions. But don't feel like you have to rip all the dandelions out either. Save your back. Okay, I'll be back soon. Bye-bye.